good evening, happy Easter, and welcome to another Wooden Spoon Productions brought to you by Fiona Malaisho. And welcome, as always, to all of you who've joined us from up and down Whitmore Gardens, from across the UK and indeed across the globe, especially on a lovely sunny afternoon like today. We're joined this evening by Andrew Kolsky, who you will know as a stand-in for Suzanne, but what a wonderful stand-in. We are very, very lucky to have two fabulous art historians sharing their knowledge with you. Andrew studied art history and his specialism was Renaissance art. Uh, in which uh, there is much, much Christian imagery, particularly of Easter. And Andrew is going to tell us the Easter story, the four days of the Easter story, from among his favourite pictures, from among many, many thousands. He's got a fabulous selection to share with us. And I have, of course, had a preview, and it is brilliant. What he's put together for us this evening is fabulous. There will be time for questions at the end. We will mute your microphones, as always, and we hope we won't mute our own in the process. So thank you for being here um, and over now to you, Andrew. Thank you, Barbara. Hello everybody and happy Easter. Um, good to see you all. And um, hopefully Fiona will press the button and we'll see some pictures. It, as, as Barbara said, it's um, very much sort of a, a personal selection of my own favorites of, of so, so many uh, pictures of, of the Easter scenes that, that um, there are so many to choose so from. So apologies if I missed out your favorites and I've had to also skip over some episodes from the story in order to fit everything in. But um, we're beginning where the Easter weekend begins with uh, the Last Supper. Last Supper was often, as in this case, depicted in the refectory of a convent or monastery or church. Um, the refectory being the dining hall, so quite appropriate. And on the end wall behind all the dining monks or nuns, there'd be a picture of the Last Supper, particularly in Florence. If you go to Florence, there's quite a few of these things to see. This one is by Domenico Ghirlandaio from 1480 in the Church of the Ogni Santi in Florence. Uh, I've chosen this one because I like it, because I, I think it's particularly attractive, rather than the perhaps more obvious and more famous one by Leonardo da Vinci in Milan, which is also in a refectory, by the way. So, um, but I think this one is just sort of very, very beautifully painted, lovely, clear, crisp, bright. The, 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 the white linen tablecloth with its embroideries, the, the, the food on the table, the glistening glassware and silverware. Um, and it's got that illusionistic space, which you also see in the Leonardo, although this came first by some years, extending beyond the architecture of the room, which you can see the white architecture of the room into those arches that are illusionistic into the garden beyond, um, full of tree, trees with fruit and birds. Um, but it's not just a pretty scene. There's some symbolism in here, too, particularly if you look on the window ledge on the right hand side, you'll see there's a peacock and that peacock was a symbol of immortality and indeed the resurrection, which is obviously a key part of the Easter story, and as are some of the evergreen trees behind. Um, and so and so the story begins with the Last Supper. They have their supper. Um, Jesus talks about the bread and the wine um, and says, one of you will betray me, and they all deny it. But as I noted there, Judas is marked out as, as the bad guy. Um, I mean, this relates also to the Jewish festival of Passover or Pesach, that happens at the same time of year as Easter. And of course, the Latin for Easter, Pascha, is the same as the Hebrew Pesach, more or less, which you find in a lot of um, modern Romance languages for, like French, Italian. The English Easter is more from Germanic roots, and you'll find similar names for that in, in Ger D German and Dutch. Um, so, uh, say that's sort of the, fir the first scene of, of the story, of this part of the story, anyway, of the Easter weekend. So, should we, should we move on? To yeah, yeah is this this is the Thursday evening, Thursday isn't it? Evening, I mean, yeah. we're literally you're going to take us through day by day. Yeah, yeah. So this is later that evening. Um, so this is the Agony in the Garden by Andrea Mantegna um, from about 1455. This is in the National Gallery in London. So uh, the story here is after after that Last Supper, Jesus and some of the disciples who you can see sleeping in the foreground going to the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus, knowing his fate, facing his fears, prays um, and, and receives, as you can see, a top left, a heavenly vision of, of, of things to come and sort of resigns himself to his fate, as you can see there with angels holding the cross, which will appear shortly. Um, Mantegna was from Padua, worked in Venice, uh, was associated with the Bellini family, 
um, and um, apparently this this composition was uh, modelled on a drawing by by Jacopo Bellini, the, the father of the family, which is in the British Museum, uh, and his brother-in-law Giovanni Bellini, the famous painter, painted a very similar scene. Um, actually after the Mantegna and you can see them side by side in the National Gallery it's very hard to choose uh, which one to depict though thanks to Pat Witts, Pello Pat for helping me make the decision um, I mean you can see in here Mantegna was very interested in sculpture and perspective and you can see that in the figures of the um, sleeping apostles he was influenced by the work of Donatello the sculptor who worked in Padua there's very sort of geometric sort of perspective forms there and, 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 the, and the sort of solidity of the rocks um, behind the um, apostles, you can see in the distance Judas leading the soldiers to come forward to arrest Jesus. Um, in, uh, in, on the path in between those two groups, just below the curse, you can see that there was actually some, some, some rabbits, not quite Easter bunnies, um, on the path confronting each other. And um, actually further to the right on the left hand edge on the upper path, you see two more rabbits facing, facing off against each other. There's the conflict to come and a very foreboding black bird at the, at the top of the, of the picture on the right. Um, and then we go to that next day. Uh, no, it's, it's immediately afterwards, actually, the next scene. You can see the soldiers are approaching on the right in this, and here the soldiers arrive to arrest Jesus. This is the arrest of, the arrest of, the arrest of Christ and sort of the, the kiss of Judas. So in the centre of the scene, you can see Judas kissing Jesus to mark him out as the one to be arrested, uh, almost enveloping in his cloak. With, with the, the soldiers crowding crowding around behind to make a very, very sort of dramatic, intense, claustrophobic scene. Yes. Um, holding their torches aloft in the, into the night sky. On, on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see um, St. Peter in his, usually is marked out in blue and gold on the left-hand side of the picture. Um, and as it says in the Gospels, he's cutting the ear off one of the servants. Now on the left-hand side, that's St. Peter cutting the ear off. The, one of the servants of, of, of the high priest who's come to arrest Jesus in, in the melee, making this a very, very bold and dramatic scene. This is painted by, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'm just going to say a bit about, this is painted by Giotto in about 1304, 1305. This is very early, but he's already sort of for, for, foreshadowing sort of the Renaissance style in this, with, with the, the dramatic uh, and emotional scene that he set up here. And it's one of a, part of a series of frescoes in the Scrovenni Chapel, also known as the Arena chapel in Padua which is which has the whole cycle of the life of Christ and the life of the Virgin and it's incredibly sort of beautiful but also very important sort of one of the first sort of major works of, of, of art um, as I say pre-Renaissance but, but, but sort of showing where Renaissance, the Renaissance style is coming from. I find it extraordinary that that is 700 years old I mean, the vibrancy of the colours and the incredible energy and anger in the picture the fact that it's 700 years old is extraordinary yeah. to me. Well, I mean, if you go to if you go to Padua, if you get the chance and go into the Arena Chapel, I mean, this is just one of many scenes. The whole chapel is absolutely covered in these frescoes by Giotto. It's one of the most wonderful places to visit, if you like art. Should we go to the next one? Yeah, yes, ne next, please. Um, we're jumping forward 300 years. Um, and, and into the, the other, the far side of the Renaissance, we're more into sort of the Baroque era now. So this is um, Christ before the High Priest. So he's been arrested. He's now sort of being sort of questioned and tried um, before the High Priest. Um, this is still the Thursday night. Hence, it's a nighttime scene with that candlelight illuminating the two figures, um, Christ on the right and, and, the, and the High Priest questioning him on the left. Um, this is by uh, Gerrit van Honthorst, and it's from about 1617. This one's in the National Gallery in London, so hopefully you can see, go and see that fairly soon. Um, now, van Honthorst was known as one of the Dutch Caravaggists. He brought the, the very modern style of Caravaggio uh, to Northern European art, and he's very much following Caravaggio's sort of interest in, in, in light and dark, focusing on sort of the, the key drama of the scene and the figures in it. The, the others are just sort of fading into the background, so much so. I, that you're not, we're not even sure exactly what this scene is. Um, in, the, in the gospel story, Christ appears first before the priest Anas, then before the priest Caiaphas. It's not entirely clear which of them this is, and it doesn't really matter. Um, but it just demonstrates that part of the story that, that um, he's sort of tried, and then ultimately, the, the next morning when he appears before Roman governor Pontius Pilate, he's then condemned to death. Um, but I've only included one trial scene, and, and I happen to 
choose this one. Um, the light from I, the ca yeah, the light yeah. from the candle there, reflecting on his robe, is 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 yeah. stunning. It's it's it feels warm and really claustrophobic. I love this picture. Shall I go yeah. to the next one? Yes, please. So we've moved on a bit. He's he's been um, he's been tried and convicted, and he's been scourged and mocked, and he's had the crown of thorns placed on his head. And so now this is Christ carrying the cross to the place of execution. Um, and this particular version is by one of my very favourite artists, Lorenzo Lotto, from Bergamo, worked in Venice where this was produced, didn't uh, succeed there and worked a lot in northern Italy. Uh, this particular picture is in the Louvre in Paris, um, so I always like to visit it there. And again, it's very intense, very claustrophobic, very emotional. You can see the suffering figure of Christ is really the, the, the centre of this picture. Everything else is sort of compressed. You can't see the whole of the cross he's carrying. You can't see the whole of the faces of the soldiers mocking him, pressing in from the left and the right. But you can see that sort of mystical light that emanates from him, reflecting off their metal helmets. Um, and it's just a very intense and very beautifully painted scene. And just briefly, Andrew, because you told me yesterday, tell me why there are so many Christian paintings or paintings showing the Christian story in this period? Well, I, I suppose that because the, church, the Christian church was very much a part of everybody's lives and the church itself was one of the main patrons commissioning these works. Um, a lot of them would, be, would appear in churches as altarpieces or as frescoes. Um, some of them, which we'll come to see later, might have been smaller works for people's private devotion in their homes if they were rich patrons. Um, it was just so much embedded in, in, in the culture of the time that it was the predominant subject matter of, of, of art into the pre and post Renaissance periods. Um, I mean, what you see in the Renaissance is you start seeing other, other themes coming in um, from, from the classical world and classical stories. And it's not really until you get into the 17th century that you start seeing other genres like landscape for its own right, or still life for its own right, um, become established as artistic genres in themselves. OK, shall I move on to the next one? Yes, please. The, um, the most important scene of uh, this is a Good Friday, the crucifixion of Christ. And there are so many, so many pictures of the crucifixion, of course, because it is so central to, to the Christian st story. And there'd be one, one in every church um, and possibly one in every home. Um, and well, I say one in every church, possibly several. Um, so, so many hundreds of thousands to choose from, but again, I've just gone for a personal favourite. Um, again, the National Gallery in London, because I know and I'm so familiar with that collection. Um, this, this particular scene is by Antonello de Massina in 1475. It's quite a small picture, and as I mentioned, some, some of these might have been painted for private devotion. This might be one of those, or it might have been painted for a small side chapel, because it really is just sort of, you know, one foot by two foot, something like that. A small, a small, very intense panel, and you know some of the some of the scenes because we are after looking at an execution are quite heartrending, quite in some cases gory. This one is more is is a, is a quieter, more contemplative, more reflective scene. Um, Christ on the cross, of course. Beneath him, the Virgin Mary on the left, Saint John the Evangelist on the right. Most of the other crowd of followers are are disappearing into the distance. You can just about make them out at the foot of the cross, disappearing into the countryside. Uh, and I, I just mentioned that landscape as, as a, in its own right as a genre didn't appear until later centuries, but you can lose yourself in this landscape. It's so beautiful, the landscape behind it, that, that just makes this scene so calm and serene. Um, ironic for, for a crucifixion, really. But what you can see at the base of the cross are the skulls of previous executions. I mean, as it says in the, the, the Gospels, um, the execution, execution took place on the, on the hill of uh, Golgotha, which means place of the skull. It's uh, peaceful, but a bit something quite gory about it as well. Yes, yeah, yes. Um, I mean, a bit on the artist Antonello was from Messina, hence the name. So he was one of the leading southern Italian artists of the Renaissance period. But he also brought in uh, the influence of northern, northern European, Netherlandish art. Reputedly, at least according to Vasari, one of the first to paint in oils, which allows that clear, crisp brightness of this picture. And he's also sort of drawing on the style of, of artists like uh, Van Eyck and Van der Weyden bringing that influence into Italian art. And you said it's very small, physically quite a small picture? 
yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can get your, your face right in it and really, as I say, lose yourself in, in either in the landscape as I do or in the contemplation of the of, 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 of the emotional scene and the religious message. OK, so we move forward. Yes. Um, time. So, well, again, we're not moving forward very far. This is, this is sort of the, the immediate aftermath. There are various scenes, and again, it was hard to choose of, first of all, the deposition from the cross, whether actually taking the body of Jesus down from the cross, the lamentation over, over the dead body, which is what we see here, and the entombment, which we're coming to. And so they overlap. They're very from painting for sculpture. But what you can see is um, the central figure is the Virgin Mary holding Jesus in her lap, Weeping over 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 his death, the followers lament, lamenting, as the sense of the title goes, that it's very very emotional. You can see on the right, St John the Evangelist again with his head in his hands. Um, second from the right, I think that's Mary Magdalene, weeping and wailing with her arms stretched out, um, and the other Marys obviously sort of weeping too over, over, over this loss. Um, and this is a, a bronze relief by Donatello, the great Italian Renaissance sculptor, the pioneer of Renaissance sculpture. Um, again, this is a small piece as well. And this is actually in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, so again, we can go and visit visit this when, when the museum opens. The V&A has the finest collection of Italian sculpture outside of Italy. So good place to go as well as copies of, of work still in Italy. Um, and this, it's quite highly finished, which suggests that this was made as a finished work. So given the scale, possibly for private devotion, it's not terribly clear. The figures have no background to them, but it might have been intended to be set against a stone or wooden framed background, which would have given it a setting. So it's, it's a bit unusual and it's not clear whether it's quite late in his career, but Donatello worked in Padua. And I mentioned that um, Mantegna was from Padua and probably would have known Donatello's sculptures as an influence. But also I think, Donatello was, was influenced by Giotto. And I think you can see that in the emotional figure of, of Mary Magdalene here. It sort of echoes some of the other works of Giotto in the, in the Arena Chapel. And it's quite, um, it, it is a, do you call it a relief? So there's nothing on the back. It would have been set against yeah. a wall. Yeah, also against a wall or, or, or in a frame, yes. Um, yeah, so, so, it, so the figures are three-dimensional, but they're not fully rounded. So, yes, the next one, again, moving on very slightly in the story. Um, and this one's also called a lamentation, but it's slightly, as I say, the scenes overlap. This is actually the entombment, the moment of putting the body of Christ into the tomb, and you can see the empty tomb behind. Um, we're getting to know some of the familiar figures in the scene. So, again, St John the Evangelist in red on the right, Virgin Mary on the left, supporting the body of Christ. In the foreground kneels St Mary Magdalene uh, with her pot of ointment. Which is one of her attributes. Um, the figures behind are Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who are also mentioned in the Gospels as attending at the uh, at the crucifixion. And just above them, in the background, you can see the three crosses on the hillside for Jesus and the two thieves who were crucified alongside him in the city. In the background, being Jerusalem, and again, beautiful landscape in which this very emotional scene is set. This is the now bye bye. Roger van der Weyden, who's a Netherlandish Flemish artist, although he travelled to Italy, so again that, that exchange of, of artistic styles between the Netherlands and Italy is, is visible here, and he actually visited Florence. This picture is in Florence, um, and it's not known whether or not he painted it for the great Medici family of Florence, but it was certainly in their collection by the end of the 15th century, and it's still in, in the Uffizi Gallery there today. Um, Amazing colours again. I, uh, yeah. I'm just stunned by how the colours have stayed through the centuries. The red yeah. Yeah. here is just extraordinary. Yes, very, very intense again. That, that, he brings that sort of northern light to it. Uh, so, so now we're moving on. Now we move to the next day, the three Marys at the se sepulchre. Uh, so they've come back on the Saturday to, to visit the tomb and find that it's empty, much to their surprise. And they say, Who's, who's stolen the body of Jesus? And they meet these two strange figures who say, as angels who say, he's gone, he's been resurrected, he's, he's been saved. Um, which is what, what, that, what the scene is being shown here. This is a version by Jacopo di Cione and his workshop. Again, from the National Gallery in London. And it's part of a, of a large altarpiece from a, 
Florentine, again, a church in Florence that no longer exists. Um, the altarpiece has been broken up, but many of the panels are in the National Gallery. Um, and it's, actually, this isn't the central scene. The central scene is the coronation of the Virgin. And there are various small panels around, around that depicting scenes from the life of Jesus and the Virgin Mary. This is one of those scenes. And this is in a fairly sort of stylized style known as International Gothic. And the date 1370, this is actually 65 years later than the Giotto we saw, we saw but in a much more conservative style. Um, it's much um, flatter, space is sort of suggested rather than represented with the cartoonish trees and landscape, with the sky of gold rather than blue. The emphasis is very much on surface decoration. So you can see the, 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 the robes, the draperies and the halos around the saints and angels are very beautiful. They've got lots of detailed gold leaf in them, but the, 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 the figures underneath are a bit, you know, here and there. Um, is not, not really realistic representation of the human figure that you would find in the Renaissance just a few years later. Um, and it doesn't have the emotion or the drama of the scene of Giotto from 65 years earlier, but it does have a lot of beauty in it. And actually in the foreground, that field is full of flowers, including plenty of blue grape hyacinths, which are very much out at the moment. And as you're going outdoors looking in people's front gardens, which is about as well as we can get at the moment, then you can see lots of these grape hyacinths flowering at the moment. So it's very right for the season. Would this have been painted on wood? Did you say? Yes, this this will be this will be um, on a, on a wooden panel. Um, I haven't checked, but probably poplar if it's Italian Renaissance, um, and in uh, probably a, a, in a, a egg tempera. What does that mean? Sorry. No, that means that the pigment is bound with um, egg white rather than oil. Um, so they grind the pigment. And they and they, and they and they and they they put the mix of the pigment, the dried pigment for whatever it is, with with egg white as the binding material to paint it onto the panel. Yes, oil painting didn't come in until the mid mid fifteenth century, where oil was used to bind the the, the pigment rather than egg. Oh, well, I, that that I've learned something very new. Thank you yeah. for that. Egg white. Yes, but okay. a lot of the, a lot of the paintings you look at looking at will have used will be in egg temper. Yeah. Hmm. Um, my screen has gone blank. Is that right? We can see you, but you can't see us. Is that my computer? Just completely. Don't worry. Well, I know we. I know you've struggled with Zoom. Can you see us or not? Because we can see you. I've got. I'm back now. I'm back now. Some, okay. My computer locked itself out. So okay. Apologies well, for that. Okay. He'll be, he'll be panicked there. I was wondering what let's, I was going to say about this painting. Let's move on. Well, this is this is this is this is um, this is a, this is a woodcut rather than a painting. So the tomb is empty. Where's Jesus gone? Uh, he's gone down to limbo to to rescue the souls for, from from purgatory. I th I'm not sure this is actually in the Gospels, but it's you know a traditional part of the story that's depicted. And this was such a lovely picture, I couldn't leave it out. Um, this is a woodcut by Albrecht Dürer, the, the German artist, um, who, as well as being a painter, transformed the the media of, of woodcut and also engraving. So he so he drew a design that would be cut into a wooden block. So this all the light and dark lines you can see here are actually physically cut into a wooden block from which um, print copies would be made. And I've, I've credited this to the Albertina Museum in Vienna, but because it was a series of prints, um, you know, he could make many copies. Um, this was sort of said, according to Wikipedia, that the particularly good version, as you make more copies, the wood would wear down and, and the quality would, would decline. Um, it's from a series called The Great Passion. So I think there's a series of about 11 woodcuts in this series depicting the story we've just seen, but I've just chosen one of them. It's called The Great Passion, or The Large Passion, simply because he, he subsequently did another version that was in a, a smaller size print, so that was the, the small passion, this is the big one. But it's a, it's a, it's a very dramatic scene again, he makes so much of the, of the medium of, of woodcut. Um, and what you can see, central figure of, of Jesus in the middle, of course, with, with the halo sort of radiating from him, and he's lifting, I think, that's St. John the Baptist out of, out of the dungeon of, of purgatory that there, with the devils all, all sort of leaning out the windows, being a bit unhappy about this. And um, behind Jesus, you can see, I think, that's Moses holding the cross, who's already been rescued. And either side of Moses, you can see the figures of um, Adam and Eve. Um, and Jesus himself is holding the banner of the resurrection, which you can see sort of that other banner with, with the cross in it, echoing the cross being held by um, Moses and also sort of curving around the architecture of the building. And um, 
I mean, Jura's a very interesting artist. There's a National Gallery exhibition coming on later this year about Jura. Um, and, you know, he was one of the first artists who said, I am an, I am an artist. I'm not a mere craftsman working for, for a commission. I, I'm important. And you can see how important he feels he is by putting his initials AD, his monogram, into his prints in the for, right in the foreground there. Um, and one of the reasons he, he worked so much in, in, in both woodcut and engraving, which is uh, cut into a metal plate, is that gave him so much more control over his art because he wasn't doing what the patron told him to do. But also he could sell multiple copies and he could make a lot more money that way. So he was um, like one of the first first celebrity artists. Well, he certainly had a, had a, had a very strong reputation, but he also had a strong opinion of himself. Uh, those of you who joined Suzanne's talk on self-portraits may recall his very bold and striking self-portrait um, in, in, the, in, the, in the sort of almost as a Christ himself. Um, he had a very high regard for himself uh, and his works of art. And uh, he wrote to one of the patrons who did he did do a painting for, saying, this is how you look after the painting. You've got to, you've got to varnish it properly, you've got to look after it. And if you do, it will last 500 years. And 500 years on, you can still see that, see that painting in good condition. So he knew what he was talking about. And the detail, I can't believe the, the, yeah. the detail that somebody can create just by carving finely in wood. It's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no one else has ever done woodcuts like you. Uh, Okay, so then so we come to the, the this crucial is, moment. This is your personal. This is your personal favourite, I think. Yes, yes. Well, this is this is this is Easter Sunday. This is today, the day of the resurrection, and uh, this is the moment of resurrection. Christ stepping out of the tomb, and you can see in this version he's stepping out very boldly, still holding the banner of the resurrection, which you can now see is, is the familiar um, from other other areas, red cross on a white ground. Um, which, which we know as the, as, the, as, the, as the flag of England, but it was a sort of from the banner of the resurrection, it became the cross of St. George. And you may know the story of St. George and the dragon rescuing the princess from the dragon is sort of an allegory of Christ rescuing the, the souls from the devils in limbo. And of course, when St. George, the warrior saint, was adopted as the patron saint of England, the cross of St. George became the flag of England. Oh. But that's, sort of, that's just sort of an incidental part of, of this scene. The power is that figure stepping out of that tomb, that, that bold, muscular figure, directly engaging us with his view uh, while the soldiers sleep below. Um, and uh, this is by Piero della Francesca, one of my very favourite artists, painted in around 1460. Piero was from this very tiny Tuscan town called San Sepulcro, and he painted this, this is a fresco, on the wall of, the, of what was the town hall, now the, now the museum, in San Sepulcro. So if you want to see it, you have to go to this little town in the, in the countryside, which I did once many years ago on the bus from Arezzo. I saw this picture and I, just, I was just bowled over by it. I put it the, sort of in, on, the, on the corner on the left, an insert into how it's just sort of set into the wall. Uh, it's almost life size. It's in quite a small room. The place was empty. I was there on my own and suddenly this figure was stepping out of the wall at me. It was so powerful. Um, you failed yes, to share there, Andrew, that you were... You told me you were only 19 when that picture I, I, I had that impact 19. on you. And that made it you did. decide to study history of art. It was, yeah, I mean, seeing this and other works by Piero in Arezzo, uh, it really did sort of have a huge impact on me. And, and I did, yeah, that was very much part of why I wanted to study history of art, yes. Um, and and this, a bit more, this character that, that, here. That is, that is a self-portrait by Piero, uh, reputedly, but there are other, other, other sort of corroborating images. Um, yes, so that says he included himself in this picture. Piero was very interested in perspective and geometry. He wrote treatises on geometry, and uh, you can sort of see that in the in the sort of the, the foreshortening of, of the face there, and that, that odd angle, presumably done in a mirror. That um, he's, he's, he's included himself right at the heart. You can see that I mentioned the banner. That that flagpole is going right behind his head, so he's really sort of sort of centered himself in that scene. So after the resurrection, Christ appears to his disciples to, to let them know he's back. The first, the first person he reveals himself to is Mary Magdalene. She's back in the cemetery visiting the grave, and he does not recognise him. And as it says in the Gospel of St John, supposing him to be the gardener. I just love that line. Supposing him to be the gardener, she asks where Jesus is, and, and he reveals himself and says, do not touch me, because he's now divine. He's no longer sort of of this world. And what you see here, well, first of all, you see Jesus is holding a gardening implement, so you can't blame her for supposing him to be the gardener in his hand. 
but also you see the, the really tense emotional moment of her reaching out and him pulling back. There's a real sort of tension and drama in that sort of moment of not touching. And that, the picture is taken from the Latin for that. Noli me tangere, do not touch me. Um, another of my favourites from the National Gallery in London by Titian, an early work of his of 1514. So again, you're quite seeing quite a highly finished polished style that he took from his master Giorgione. Again, set in a beautiful landscape. And the way the tree comes down and the path comes down from the farm is sort of really sort of focusing the eye on that central scene. But you do see some sheep in, in the background to the left, sort of, sort of referring to Jesus as the Good Shepherd. But again, a really beautiful, touching picture. I love again, the blue favorite. here. Yeah. I love that amazing deep blue at the back. Yeah, okay. so Titian does, does some lovely blues. I mean, if you want to slip into the, um, the mythological side, it's Bacchus and Ariadne in, um, in the National Gallery. It has some lovely blues in it. That's by the way. <laughs> So now we come to the Supper at Emmaus. We're still in the National Gallery in London um, by Caravaggio. Again, we've moved on a bit in time to 1600-ish, 1601. So the scene here is um, on the third day after the crucifixion, which would be Monday, I guess. Two of the disciples, not all the Gospels specify which ones, were walking to Emmaus and they met the resurrected Christ. They didn't know who he was, but over supper, again, he revealed himself to them. And this is, this is sort of depicting that dramatic moment where they suddenly realise who he is. So the two disciples sitting either side of the table are sort of stretching their arms out. The one with his back to us is sort of leaning out of his chair. The one on the right wearing the, um, the pilgrim badge of uh, the pilgrim to Santiago de Compostela, which is a contemporary reference, has his arms stretched out in amazement while Jesus is emanating the light that illuminates the picture. Um, and as I said, you know, earlier this is the, the that, that sort of very dramatic light and dark style that Caravaggio pioneered that Van Honthorst and others were, were copying and that's that that light sort of casts a shadow behind Jesus which is almost in place of a halo um you know the again very intense dramatic moment of this scene um and um Caravaggio typically has depicted the disciples in very sort of down to earth everyday dress you can see on the on the left the, the elbow in the foreground is worn and tattered in the jacket there this was this was really this was really quite shocking at the time um that he would dare to to, to, to depict sort of saints with, uh, as ordinary working class people but that was that was that was Caravaggio sort of very sort of earthly way of, way of depicting this, this mystical scene this divine light um and in the foreground um, almost as a still life composition, as I said, still life, not yet a genre in his own right. Wonderful bowl of fruit and a roast chicken and some bread and wine in the glass, in the carafe there, all illuminated by that divine light. And that sort of draws us in to this picture where that bowl is hanging off the edge of the tablecloth there, right into our space. Um, and so, I mean, the story goes on, but that's sort of the end of the Easter weekend. Um, and so we, we sort of begin as we started with a meal thank you thank you so much i thought that was sensational i learned so much through that i love the way you didn't just choose great pictures but you took us through the story and showed us details which i had no idea about i'd never have guessed that the sheep in the background alluded to jesus being the good shepherd and i'd never have guessed that rabbits were fighting because of what was going to happen foreseeing what was going to happen to him. I mean, that was wonderful. I absolutely loved that. Thank you, Andrew, so much. I know how much effort you've put into producing that. And I hope Thank you're you. going to take us around the National Gallery after lockdown. One day. Um, you, always, you always play down your knowledge. Andrew always says he's no specialist, but your knowledge is absolutely stunning.